Okay. Well, thank you. It's great to be here. And it's great to follow our previous speaker, because I think I'm going to talk about many things, including energy, innovation, batteries. And actually, I agree with him more than the, the previous speakers in terms of the optimism. Uh, so let me just think about scale first. And I want to just mention here the scale of the problem at hand. Um, the number of stars that we can see in the visible universe, sorry, yes, the number of atoms that are in the visible universe, if we were just to look at, outside in a clear sky, will be of the order of 10 to the 82. So I just want you to think about that number. 10 to the 82 is probably the largest number, one of the largest numbers out there. No. But now if you think about the number of possible molecules and materials we can make, in principle it's infinite, but in practice obviously we are constrained by the chemistries and the way we uh, make the materials, etc. So there's many, many estimates out there, and uh, mostly from the pharma industry, and chemical space, as we call this space, and you want to compare it to, again, uh, regular space, is 10 to the 60 to 10 to the 180 medium-sized molecules. So there's more molecules that we can make than atoms in the visible universe. Now let's talk about the challenges of the 21st century. Many of them have been mentioned. If you go to this website, 21st century, yes, you can see that clean energy, which for me is the top, and emissions, sustainability, plastic pollution, all of them have to do with materials, right? So the question is, how can we make materials discovery faster, right? How can we make sure that we unleash the discovery engine so that we can discover materials in all these areas and actually transform the 21st century? So that has been my goal. But even if you're, you know, motivated just by saving the planet, some people here were clapping to oil. I am very really disappointed about that. So those clappers in oil, this is also a very good opportunity too, okay? Barron's just said that there's three technologies that could drive each one of them a trillion dollar market. Turns out that I have two startups in three, Two out of the three. I just don't have a startup in CRISPR. One of them is quantum computing, and the other one is AI for materials, okay, which are what I'm talking to you about today. How can robotics, AI, and materials, how can robotics, AI, and high-performance high computing allow us to discover materials faster so we can provide the technology for the innovators down the, round, down the road in the technology development so that we actually deploy clean energy technologies everywhere? So again, that's Barron's, but if you don't believe Barron's, go to the MIT Technology Review. This beautiful article by David Rothman talks about how AI is reinventing the way we invent. Actually, AJ is interviewed in the article as well. Uh, and it's all about, uh, uh, his scholarship is on this as well, how, how can we also underestimate how important it's going to be AI in certain sectors. And I think AI for discovery of new scientific uh, 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 the discoveries, AI for new scientific discoveries is also underestimated, okay? So I wish material space, uh, you know, chemical space, is gonna be like this cornucopia where I just put my hand under a basket and I come up with the right material. Turns out that materials discovery is a funnel, you know? Basically, if you start with the 10 to the 180 possibilities, usually humans lower it down to millions of molecules that are possibly feasible. This is already a very, very sparse space in all the possibilities of things we can make. And then we can also run quantum chemistry calculations, uh, use our human brain, and down select to tens of devices that we can make. Okay, so I'll tell you a couple examples where that's kind of like the throughput of a typical academic researcher that I consider myself innovative can do as of today, and I'm trying to change that. So again, for me, materials are key for clean energy technology. Each one of the things that you see there has major materials opportunities and challenges. Uh, even the most disruptive materials technologies, like even fusion, will require very interesting coatings to have a tokamak work, right? But even if we go to more, the more pedestrian ones, I want to talk about something that the previous speaker also mentioned. I was very happy, batteries. But for that, I'm going to have one of the people I respect the most talk about them. Uh, as a company that provides multi-megawatt energy storage solutions, uh, using, and I have no idea what this is, <laughs> vanadium redox fuel cells. <laughs> That's one of the coolest things I've ever said out loud. I miss you, man. I miss you, really. Uh, so he said extremely good things, except one. There's not enough vanadium in the crust of the air to actually do store all the energy that we need for the clean energy transition. Humanity has not stored energy at the massive scale, right? 
So in my research group and my collaborators when I was at Harvard saw a huge opportunity. How can we discover new energy storage materials that do not require metals, right? And that's where we came in with, our, with a project. We developed what is now a large field. It's called the Organic Read of Flow Battery Field. And the way we did it is by trying to innovate. We use, of course, computers, which is my specialty. Now I'm into robots too, but computers. And we collaborated extremely closely with chemists and engineers to synthesize and test uh, molecules. Uh, we met every week, which is painful, but we did. And we came up with uh, this molecule in about three months. This, this is anthraquinone disulfonate. We also call it Jesus Christ quinone for its shape. And uh, that molecule already is our generation one molecule was already better than vanadium at most of basically all of the parameters except stability. As it was already said, you need to charge and discharge these things about 20,000 times. So the molecule has to last for a long time. 10,000 is probably enough. So what we did um, is basically, of course, publish a bunch of nice papers in nature and science and create a field and so on, right? Even dress myself as, a science, as an experimentalist at the time. Uh, this is basically the product of about $5 million and five years of ARPA-E funding, another big idea of Obama, right? E public investment in, cl in clean energy disruption is crucial for actually making these things work. Notice that the other side of the battery, we were a little bit academic about it. We said or metal free, but we were using bromine, which is not necessarily the best technology to put in your basement. You do not want a, 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 a tank of bromine in your basement. We're still working on that other side of the battery. Again, this is a new technology that came out of uh, you know, our sleeves, right? So it takes a lot of time, right? I am very happy to announce that you know, a few weeks, maybe a few months ago by now, we announced in the journal Jewel, which is one of the top energy journals, this molecule that we call Methuselahquinone. After screening about the one million molecules on the computer and making about 100 or so molecules, we finally find a molecule that on that side of the battery will fade at the rate that we need to actually make this commercial. Right? So maybe you will clap and say, wow, these scientists, you know, whatever. <laughs> too freaking slow. Okay? It's too slow because we had 12 years to really do something dramatic. And we had already one speaker that was saying, he predicts we're not going to change as fast. We had another speaker that said we will. Right? So why is it too slow? Because making a material usually takes 10 years, okay, at least, and 10 to 100 million dollars to reach market. So even if I discover this battery today, right, by the time this battery is commercialized, right, it's going to be too late, right? So can I accelerate the discovery process? That has been my mission since I started. Uh, maybe maybe three or four years ago, I said, look, Alan, concentrate and start building a lot of initiatives to think about how can we go from hundreds of molecules ideated and tested, and you can see the pipeline there, to an accelerated pipeline that actually stands on top two of the drivers of this 21st century economy, which are automation, which again has extremely uh, drops, dropouts in cost that could have been mentioned as well in the previous talk as well, right? And also AI, which has becoming more and more ubiquitous. AI is becoming a tool that almost any high schooler can use. It's amazing how many high schoolers write to me about, oh, I downloaded your code for generating molecules. Here are my first results. People from high school, okay? So in other words, the, these two technologies can allow us to actually move down the discovery uh, um, um, process faster and faster and faster, okay, to thousands of molecules of device fabrication and testing. And then that way the feedback to an AI augmented uh, discovery engine will actually allow us to, to, to basically make, make materials. And our goal is extremely humble. We want to just get a factor of 10 here. We're going to go from $10 million in 10 years to $1 million and one year, and why is that what's so important? Because if we get there, then all these venture capitalists, uh, capital, ca capital investors will actually go into the materials market. They will say, oh, now everybody can make a startup about it. So it's talking about the democratization of discovery. Discovery has been in our ivory towers. What we want to do is that anybody can discover with automated, as we like to call them, self-driving laboratories, which is probably the best way to explain what we want to do. Okay, so. In a science paper that we just published recently, you can see the current paradigm of discovery, which is that linear discovery that I'm trashing my own research on organic flow batteries, introducing a new technology, $5 million, five years, right, ready to be commercialized. But I want to do it faster, and we call this closing the loop. At every point of the way in the scientific process, we will have an AI help us make decisions. So a robot is making experiments overnight. I can go watch the Raptors game, and my robot steals. is doing science, right? Uh, and what I want to do then is basically, you know, make sure that every time I wake up, I see, did the robot ride correctly? Did it crash? Right? Can I help the robot continue? And then it's a
effect of the human and the robot together that allow, allows to accelerate discovery. Okay? So I happen to be involved, and we, I, uh, I happen to co-write a proposal with Herman Tribukai that's sitting here, uh, Mission Innovation. Okay? Mission Innovation is one of the... How many of you know what is Mission Innovation? Okay, you see this is a problem, guys. This is one of the largest uh, things that has happened in the world, thanks to President Obama again, and almost nobody knows about it. This is a pledge of 23 countries in the European Union, including Canada and Mexico, where I originally come from, and the United States, which, by the way, left it, because now they're in a barbaric state, okay, uh, uh, to actually double the clean energy research over five years, okay? So uh, under it, there's seven worldwide projects, and turns out I was able to propose one with Herman that says, basically, let's... Uh, Let's use this materials acceleration platform I'm talking about to actually feed all the other seven projects, six projects, which are, of course, you can imagine, energy storage and energy generation and heating and cooling. All of them need materials, right? So uh, Canada and Mexico, Canada stepped up to the plate after the United States became a barbarian, and Canada and Mexico collided. And this is another one of the reasons I also moved to Canada, okay? So thanks, Canada. Now, we talked about Moore's Law. We are chemists and material scientists. We have to be in awe of the biologists. The biologists were able to actually go beyond Moore's law and sequence genomes for less than $1,000 in 18 years. This is what we need for clean energy materials discovery. Okay? So it's on top, of the, on top of our colleagues developing the scaling, and you have the scaling laws. We also need to accelerate discovery hyper-exponentially. And for that, we need to actually rethink the way we do it. And there are examples in science. This is biology. So come on, chemists and physicists. If we cannot do what biologists can do, then, you know. Uh, so for that, we also need to think about democratization, right? Again, I mentioned democratization. So my lab and I are developing this tool called ChemOS, OK? The chemical operating system is downloadable. It's an open source package, OK? It, it has several components, like the AI that drives the lab, automation and robotics, but also it has something very important. When I go to an audience of organic chemists and I ask them, how many of you, how many of you guys uh, actually know how to program in Python? And then only about five of them raise their hand. Sorry, I, okay. How do we interact with our, uh, with our uh, AI-driven laboratory? By Slack. Many of you probably have Slack in this conference. Robot in Slack. And my battery seems to be going a little bit off in my speaking. So that's an example of my student Flo talking to ChemOS. This is a very early version. ChemOS is talking back to Flo. Uh, Loic is asking for experimental procedures. And then uh, there, go, there it goes. ChemOS is actually sending the information as you speak, in terms, uh, as, you, as you go around, in terms of experiments. There's several experiments around the world controlled by ChemOS right now. And then you can go connect to Slack and talk to it. Happy to show it to you guys offline. Now this is a good shout out. Uh, to a Canadian fund, the Natural Resources Canada, thank you. As soon as I arrived, we started working together with Cortis Berlinguet, Jason Hine, and myself in ADA, it's an automatic self-driving laboratory. I'm going to show you one of the examples. I'm going to show you a few examples of the kinds of things that we're doing, because it's not just talk. We're actually building these laboratories and doing discovery. Cortis uh, actually is a co-founder of Click Materials, which is going to be speaking later today. Maybe you want to invest in his company. OK, it's about film, film technologies. So shout out to him and his company. Jason is a robot MacGyver uh, at, at UBC and myself. So we're also trying to bridge this UBC U of T rivalry thing and work together. Um, so it's amazing how fast it happened because the project started less than a year ago. Maybe three months later, we had this digital design of this Ada North Robotics made, Canadian made robot uh, by North Robotics in, in, in Victoria Island. Uh, this is a robot. And is, we agree, we believe it's the first self-driving laboratory for fin films. It's actually doing fin, uh, it's, it's actually doing spin coating for a whole transport layer, okay? A, bit, a typical component of most of the fin film devices that you know, okay? Including perovskite solar cells and including your cell phones, etc. So we're trying to optimize that particular layer and we build this robot that has a microscope, a spectrometer, a conduction measurement, uh, a liquid handler, a spin coater, etc. right? So this is how the robot looks like. We just demonstrated it to the energy ministers in Vancouver uh, a couple of weeks ago. So we actually brought it out of the lab, and it's in a cage like this. And here is, uh, here is the robot actually doing all of the different steps. Made in Canada. Yeah. So, right? You know, this used to take hours, okay? 
And people are artisanal, so they are actually making this by hand. And you have to have these scientists that are actually that are very, very good at mixing these, these chemicals. A favorite, a, a favorite story is that one of my graduate students went to Germany, made his first organic solar cell, and beat the technician that was making organic solar cells. It's so freaking random to make one of these devices, right? So now we're trying to actually systematize and make this. And this robot is quite cheap, was really quick to make, and it's modular. So modularity is very important for democratization, that almost any lab in the world can actually democratize Matthias' discovery. So that's Ada. This is one of the robots that we're working on. And this is, uh, we just submitted a paper. And the paper appears in the archive today at 5 PM. You can see the optimization. This is AI-driven Bayesian optimization, a Bayesian neural network picking uh, the top experiment for this film, film composition. And you can actually see we reach a global maximum in very few iterations. And we also find a very interesting new local maximum that suggests new physics. So computer also helps you find uh, discovery of new things because uh, AI exploring chemical space is a little bit more curious than a human that is kind of more dead set. This is another example with my friend Christoph Brabeck in Germany, a collaboration between Canada and Germany. This is a four-dimensional search for the cheapest organic solar cell. Not necessarily the most efficient, but it was already mentioned, two billion people in the world have no access to electricity. So some of those people would like to have the cheapest possible organic solar cell. So we're doing four component searches uh, using our ChemOS software and a liquid handler there in Germany. And as we age these experiments, we find that previously people did something called the sign of experiments, which is kind of like square dancing. They explore parameter space kind of in a systematic way. But with AI, we're able to find a 30 times speed up, and we reach the top material according to the specifications in 30 experiments rather than 1,024 experiments doing the old way. So uh, we have already results that we are both being sent to publication. The, the previous one was already sent. This one is going to be sent very soon of how AI can allow you to discover materials. And of course, it's coupled to automation. Another example before I tell you a little bit about entrepreneurship. This is so new that I got this slides last week. We're working with Merck, University of British Columbia. And we're using our ChemOS software to actually talk to a chem speed robot, this is the one I have here in Toronto, and, and characterization engines. And actually, the people from Merck actually added this dust to describe our ChemOS, right? Uh, ChemOS was able to beat them at a particular task, which is the NITO selectivity of one of their processes. And again, this is pharma industry. In two rounds with 150 experiments, you can see the raw data there. And uh, it's in purpose that I'm showing you the raw data, because these are the slides that I got from Merck unadulterated. And you can see there, what the AI decided to do in the experiment, and the two top experiments that are already better than what they knew how to do. And again, this is so fresh of the press that I, did, I saw the results at the conference before. You know, my, my students told me about them, but I actually saw them at the conference, and I'm showing them to you fresh of last week. So this is where we are. We have about seven or eight experiments using ChemOS around the world, doing this type of, uh, of experimentation. And of course, this is just the beginning, right? We need to actually take this software, have a a non-commercial open source uh, version okay, that everybody can use. We, of course, we need to develop also a commercial version that actually has to have you know, uh, uh, professional support, in-premises, in, in secure uh, location type of stuff. Um, my lab and I are still working on a lot of the AI. How, how can we use cheap data sets to predict large data sets? How can we have good user interfaces? Okay? Perhaps there will be augmented reality to visualize the data. right? So we really want to have to think about what is the best way to engage scientists and to use ChemOS and to automate the laboratories to accelerate discovery throughout the planet. Because if you think about places that have not been disrupted, there's one that people do not talk about too much. It's called the university. The way we scientists discover things is too slow. So we have to disrupt ourselves uh, uh, in our own business. So now I'm going to end up with talk just really talking about uh, entrepreneurship, uh, because I'm an academic. Uh, and I would like to say that many of our academics have to actually think about more how to take tech out of the lab. So my history starts about five, five years ago or so when I started discovering organic laminating diodes with Samsung, and we were very successful at that. Uh, I decided to spin out a company called Calcularyo, okay? which was, even before it actually finished its fundraising, was acquired by Kilux. Kilux is a Japanese company that was our competitors, came into Boston and said, come on, why don't you guys become the Boston office? And I was, I was against that because I wanted to build something big. My co-founder said, look, let's just merge. So we merged. Kilux is now selling materials. Okay? Kilux is a Japanese company. It just raised its next round. Uh, uh, I think it's a Series B. And uh, it's still going on. I'm happy because, of course, I have some stock in Kilux. And 
And we, we are selling materials uh, for organic lighting diodes using our technology, okay, already, at Kilux. Then uh, last year, just before leaving Harvard, another revolution happened, which is quantum computing, so quantum computing hardware started to explode faster than I expected. And my lab has been one of the pioneers of quantum computing software. We invented some of the near-term quantum algorithms. And probably that's what I'm most known for now instead of robots. Now I'm a new robot guy, but I've been doing quantum computing for about you know, 13 years. So we spin out Zapata Computing. Zapata is a Mexican revolutionary uh, that made the land is for the people. So Zapata is the quantum computer is for the people. We're building the first operating system for quantum computers. And we do a lot of B2B uh, development right now with top 500 companies. Okay? Zapata just raised its Series A in less than a year that's starting. Uh, so uh, we are already expanding to three offices. One of them is in Toronto. We have our Boston office and one in Barcelona because it's Europe and also we like the sun. Toronto doesn't have a lot of sun, so I'm going to spend some time in the, our Barcelona office. Uh, I also speak Spanish, so that helps. Uh, also, we spin out another company called Kebotix. Think of a pharma type company, a secretive research company, ooh, you know, that is doing automated self driving lab discovery, working with top 500 companies. Investors here, we're going to start raising our, uh, going to start raising, uh, our next round, our Series A in the fall, so contact me if you're interested in Kebotics. And uh, we are also uh, working on uh, perhaps, or most likely for sure, actually launching a company around Kemoe. So that's, let us know, okay? That one is still going on. Um, so uh, actually, Herman Tribukai is here. You can talk to him about it. And another very important thing is the investors really believe in you. Propagator Ventures, which is here, hopefully, Anders and Lisa can raise their hand. It's a, deep, it's a deep tech phone out of Norway. Now I'm their scientific, invest, invest, the scientific advisor. And Anders and Lisa believed in, in us early on, and they invested both in Zapata and Kebotics, right? So I really want to thank those early stage investors that see the future and say, OK, I'm going to invest in these companies. So many of you are here. Well, talk to Anders and Lisa. They are fantastic deep tech investors. And I am the science advisor. So if you can convince me that your stuff is not bullshit, then maybe we can invest. Uh, uh, if you want to learn more about materials acceleration, we have all these reports. You can take a photo of this live. A materials acceleration platform report uh, that we wrote in Mission Innovation, also with Herman sitting here. Uh, Nation Review materials. I uh, have a paper about how we're going to revolutionize material simulation. Uh, you can see here the closed loop discovery paper in, in science. And I just want to leave you with this word, right? So I believe that one of the, uh, we talked about the ocean as an untapped opportunity, and I completely agree. And I also agree that one of the largest opportunities for AI will be the space of molecules and materials. And I think people have to start thinking about that untapped opportunity uh, because there's going to be a lot of wealth generated. And I, 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 the people that clap for oil, I hope that you invest on in this instead. So thank you for that. <laughs>